don't have any outside speakers. But, yeah, I figured out what's wrong with it. Yeah. It's broken. Worship at the Cottage. My name is Teddy Baker. Along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pinner, Bobby and Dawn Privet, our whole team here at J&J, &J, we want to welcome you and uh, hope you guys had a, just a great, great Thanksgiving. Uh, especially if you're joining us via the internet, we're always honored that you take time wherever you are to tune in and be part of our worship. I'm uh, going to do uh, just a couple of great old, uh, old hymns and uh, just praise the Lord this morning. Amen. All right, everybody ready? Yeah. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises reign Glory in the heights I will shout and say Standing on the promises of God Thank 
is called Emmanuel. God with us. Christmas choruses, and I enjoy that, that song. I'm going to pray uh, today for, I uh, want to continue to pray uh, for uh, Kaylin and, and Trace. They're getting a little, little better, uh, but uh, Kaylin's mom, Carol Baker, just uh, continue to remember her. She's still in the hospital, in and out of uh, ICU, and uh, is not doing well. And I uh, want to continue to remember Dale Kramer, a friend of uh, Larry, uh, Larry Mack's partner in business, uh, has been fighting the, the flu and pneumonia and bronchitis, so we're hoping that he's getting better. I want to continue to remember Kurt and Laura Mather home today, and uh, Kurt's not feeling real well, so continue to remember them in, in your prayer. Uh, continue to remember Christine Pinner, uh, Jim's daughter out in Colorado, and uh, still, um, I guess, dealing with uh, trying to get to the breathing and everything uh, together with her. Uh, I've got a uh, message from Donna Dulac uh, last night, and um, Zachary's still fighting hard. He uh, has a brain tumor, cancerous. Well, they removed it, but and uh, yeah, they they removed the tumor. He went through the surgery, and now he's uh, just recovering. And uh, and Donna says she's just uh, blessed and grateful to be be able to be there with him. Uh, I want to continue to pray for Hans and uh, Barbara uh, Maniart. Uh, I can have to get an update on on how they're doing. Ollie Crumley, our, our little, little child, uh, has brain cancer. It's a little girl. She's just so precious. And uh, Maria, uh, Lou's wife, uh, just continuing with the vertigo. Um, let's see. Sandra's toe. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember Sandra this morning. She uh, injured her toe during the Thanksgiving, and uh, won't go into all that. But uh, yeah, go ahead. A turkey <laughs> fell on it. A frozen turkey <laughs> fell out of it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> gobble, gobble. The, the turkey's last revenge before going in the oven. <laughs> I got one. Got her toe. I want to pray for our, our friend Belinda Jenkins, who is uh, continuing to fight a brain tumor as well. And uh, just to go from South Carolina down to uh, Emory. And uh, they are looking at trying to do a, a surgery to remove a tumor behind her right eye. Uh, we've been praying for a friend of Cheryl Orihoski. Uh, Tori got a, a message from Cheryl yesterday that uh, Tori's, uh, she was readmitted into Piedmont Hospital earlier this past week. Uh, got some other issues going on uh, that are being treated along with uh, the complications from uh, end stage liver disease. And uh, she's been placed on a, a national database trying to find her a, a liver. And if they can find one, we'll do a transplant. Uh, glad to have Bobby and Dawn back and uh, getting over there. Their coals from hanging out with the Iron Duke. See, I found See, I found That's what happens. Oh, uh, I want to continue to remember uh, Kathy Coleman. Uh, still waiting on some tests back from her. Uh, white blood cell count and um, continue to pray for Larry and, and Janet Glenn and uh, uh, his brother Gilmer uh, I think in the final stages of Alzheimer's and uh, just not not doing well and uh, so I want to continue to pray pray for them uh, did I get everything covered anybody else all right let's pray our Father, we do uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to gather together in your name, to be very thankful for everything that you do in us and to us and through us. We lift up each prayer request, Father, as we do each week, believing and trusting that you're already there intervening in every situation. We pray that, Father, because we are your children and you are our Father. You love us and look over us and watch over us. 
and give us the, the strength and the perseverance to make it through difficult times. Bring healing and you bring strength and faith. You build our trust. You do those things, Father, because you love us so much. And we're very thankful for that. We pray for our message today. Come, Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out. That we might be better prepared to engage the world around us. That they might see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. We thank you for every single day that you give us. We pray your blessings in the most powerful name, that of your Son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, as I said earlier, Jan and I want to want to wish all of you a very, very happy Thanksgiving and, and hope that you all had a great time with family and friends and, of course, all the food. Jan cooked enough for, like, two armies. <laughs> Are you tired of left Yeah, that's right. We had leftovers last night, and we have one more dish today, and we're, then we're done. <laughs> so, but we hope, hope you guys. Uh, you know, today really is, is one of my, my favorite times of the year, because today is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. And if you're, not, if you're new to Advent, uh, it's based on an ancient Latin word. A.D., the first part of it, ad, is Latin for two. And vent, V-E-N-T, is Latin for come. And so it stands for to come. And so at Advent, we remember and we reflect on God coming to us. We, we look back to Jesus' first coming as we look forward with hope and anticipation to his second coming. It, it really is just an incredible. Excuse me, just a minute. It really is an incredible time during this year. It gives us that opportunity to look back, to once again get in touch with the felt experience of what I call living in the in between, between his first coming and the anticipation and hope of his second coming. And today we're going to continue in our study of the book of Hebrews. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10. And so if you have your Bibles or your apps, turn with, uh, with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to be focusing on just a few verses, verses 19 through 25. And as you turn there, let me uh, just give you a little background. Our text this morning is a, a study in application. But the author of Hebrews has been doing some intricate high theology for much of this book so far. It really, uh, that, that's why it makes it a little difficult sometimes to understand all the theological uh, terms and aspects of, of what the author has written. And so what he does now is that he takes, he takes that high theology and he begins to land it in, in our day-to-day -day living of our lives. And so we're going to be looking at, again at verses 19 through 25. And verse 19 begins by this. And I'm going to read this from the English Standard Version. And it says this. It says, therefore, brothers. And, you know, when, when you see the word therefore, what do you do? You, you ask what it's there for. <laughs> and, and so, you know, therefore, brothers, in, in light of everything that, that's been said, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What we have learned in Hebrews up to this point is that Jesus is our great, our sympathetic high priest, our heavenly advocate, so to speak, before the throne of God. Jesus is the true heavenly reality that the old covenant, the old laws and the way of, of, of worship, he is the heavenly reality the old covenant pointed to all along. If, if you remember some of the, the stories about the activities of the priest, the earthly high priest could go into the earthly holy place once a year with sacrifices for his own sin first and then for the people. However, he continually needed to be replaced with sort of a weird regularity. Why? Because he kept dying. He was human. And so they kept continually having to replace the high priest. Jesus, on the other hand, is our heavenly high priest, goes into the true holy place in heaven. Not through a symbolic earthly curtain, but through the very living curtain of his own body, given on the cross for all of mankind. If you remember the story of, uh, of the Easter story of Jesus, when Jesus died, at the moment that he died on the cross, the curtain in the Holy of Holies was ripped, and it was not ripped from the bottom up, it was torn from the top down. So that it, it was evident that no man, no human being, went in and, and, and ripped the curtain apart. It was torn from the top down. And so this, this, this work that Jesus did, we, we have an immortal, immortal, irreplaceable, gloriously for us, high priest. Every part of your relationship to God, your redemption, your salvation, forgiveness, your life now, and your life in eternity, in the, in, in the future, your future hope, all of it is because of what the Lord Jesus accomplished in his life, death, resurrection, and even in his ascension. And so this high theology about what Jesus has done for us is very important, but now the, the author of Hebrews turns from telling us what Jesus is like and what he has done to what demands that these truths that we're learning make on our lives. One of the things that God loves to do in his word is to link together two types of truths. There is a, an indicative truth and an imperative truth, imperative truth. And an indicative truth is a simple statement of fact. The sky is blue. It's, it's a fact. It's something that is simply true. An imperative truth, on the other hand, is an authoritative, authoritative command. It tells us something crucial that we must do. That's why when we come across an imperative statement in the Bible, you've heard me say before, when you see an imperative statement, in the Bible, in the Scripture, put your name in front of it. Teddy, yeah. do this. Yeah. And so, indicatives tell us this is true, and an imperative tells us go and do the only reasonable thing in light of this truth. Does that make sense? So, after this glorious indicative that the author of Hebrew has given us, Jesus is our great high priest, <laughs> whose flesh makes a living way for us to get back to God. Then he follows with three imperative truths. Let us draw near to God fully assured in our faith. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. And so I want to take these imperative truths and I want to take them one at a time and we'll see how these imperatives follow 
from the high priestly ministry of Jesus. You'll notice that each one of these applications is essentially framed on either side. In verse 19, he said, therefore. Again, you got to ask, what is therefore? And then each of the applications in verses 22 through 25 begin with the phrase, let us. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying, he's saying, therefore, because of the glorious truths that we've been considering about Jesus, about his identity, about his ministry, what he's accomplished, in light of those truths, and then he gives us these three let us statements. And so the first let us statement that the Hebrew author gave us is that let us draw near to God. Here in, in verse 22, we see that first let us statement. Therefore, let us draw near with a true heart and full, of, of, full assurance of our faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so the first application for us, based on Jesus' his person and his work, is to simply come. Let us draw near. The, the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a standing invitation for all all of us, each one of us, to come. He says, welcome to the holy places. Come, welcome to the Father. Come by the Spirit. Come with a true heart because His new covenant ministry creates new hearts. That's what He's in the business of doing. That's what the new covenant is all, all about. Come with full assurance of faith with a heart sprinkled clean from the evil deeds you've done. Come washed in the waters of your baptism, washed in the waters of the, the Holy Spirit. Come to Jesus. You and I need this reminder over and over again. We need this reminder repeatedly because, as the old hymn says, we are prone to wander prone to undo the gospel by returning to the shadows of our old way of life, just like the Israelites continue to do. And so in other words, we end, trying, we end up trying to do what Israel did under the old co covenant. We're, we're into God, we're, we, our, our faith dwindles or something happens, we, we draw away sometimes, we become isolated, all types of things happen. But the invitation is to come. There's a guy named uh, Ronald Rollheiser. He's the president of the Old Blade School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas. And he writes this. We want to be a saint, but we also want to feel every sensation experienced by the world. We, we want to be innocent and pure, but we also want to be experienced and taste all of life. We, we want to serve the poor and have a simple lifestyle, but also we want all the comforts of the rich. We want to have the depth affordable by uh, solitude, but we also do not want to miss anything. We want to pray, but we also want to watch television, read, talk, go out with friends, have a good time. And he writes, he says, it's a small wonder that life is often a trying enterprise and that we are often tired and pathologically overextended. You see, Scripture says that Jesus lived and died and rose from the, the grave and he reigns in the holy places, not so that you could, you know, homebrew some method of conscience cleansing, but so that you could come to that same holy place by faith, not by works, not by the things that we do, but by faith. That's what the Bible says. So the very first thing that we do with the gospel is simply to come. 
The very first thing it demands of us is to draw near. Again, not by our works, not by our words, but by faith in what Jesus has accomplished. We draw near with a conscience already cleans, clean by faith, already cleansed by faith. A body that's already washed by the blood of the Lamb. Through baptism, whatever your denomination, wherever your background, whatever you, you came through. And so the question is, is that do you have faith in this Christ and his work, what he actually accomplished on the cross? If you do, then, then come. Come daily. Come hourly. Come moment by moment if you need to. But come. Come into fellowship, into relationship with Jesus Christ. The second let us statement is to let us hold fast. Verse 23 urges us, therefore let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So what is the confession that we are to hold fast to? It's clear that it's a promise, right? He says, he says that we are to hold fast the confession of our hope. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. In other words, don't lose your faith. Don't give up. Don't, don't, in other words, don't be a quitter. On a drizzly Saturday afternoon in early 2015, Seven people gathered around a high-top table at Busboys and Poets. It's a restaurant in Washington, D.C. They were united by a single cause to check it all. It was the inaugural meeting of the Quitters Club. <laughs> Reality. And it, it, the, the tagline for the Quitters Club was, Let's give up on our dreams together. <laughs> Doesn't that just make you feel warm and fuzzy? <laughs> and the founder of the club, Justin Cannon, he had quit all sorts of things. He had quit filmmaking, he had quit music, graphic design, college, fashion design. He, he'd pursue a dream and then self-doubt would kick in. And then he had quit, always feeling like a failure. At a filmmaker's gathering in February of 2015, Cannon expressed his, his growing exasperation. I was like, he said, he said, he said I, was, I was like, we should have a, a support group where people who want to give up on their dreams can meet. And he said, I was making a joke. But then, he, then somebody said, you know, that's a really good idea. And a few days later, he took action. He signed up for a meetup or a organizer account online. And he, he posted a, a notice for his new group. He, he thought he might be just forming a club for one, but within 48 hours, 35 people signed up. And out of those 35 people that signed up, seven showed up at the first meeting. One was ready to cast aside her long-held ambitions to become an actress. Same deal for a would-be writer. Another was ready to quit Washington, D.C. altogether. I, that one I probably would have, you know, amen. You know, you know, you know. But the, the hodgepodge group of strangers were drawn together by the same invite that read, most of us have something special we'd like to do with our lives. Often this holy grail does us more harm than good, costing valuable time, resources, and relationships. At the Quitters Club, we can help each other stomp out the brush fires set in our hearts and get on with our lives. The strange thing was that as they gathered to talk about quitting, they ended up encouraging one another to keep on going. 
as Christ followers, we are holding fast to a confession. And that confession is a promise made by Christ himself. It is the promise of our hope. The gospel. The, the good news that the king has come to win his kingdom. That he has ransomed a people by his own blood. That he has fulfilled the law that we were in the process of creatively breaking at every point. And that he has borne our penalty for that lawlessness. The confession that we are to hold fast to is this, that Jesus has made a way back to God through the veil of His broken body and His shed blood. He made a way where there was no way. Through Himself. Through His shed blood. And so what what has this to do with Jesus' immortal, heavenly high priesthood? This is so important for, for us to see because, again, we are prone to take these kinds of commands that Jesus gives us sometimes and feel almost as if they're burdens that we must carry. As Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30, He said, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls he says for my yoke is easy and my burden is light his commands aren't burdensome his commands are life it is life itself This imperative command says, says to do what? It says to hold fast, but to what? To, to the confession that your hope isn't in you. To the confession that you are saved by grace through faith. To the confession that Christ is Lord and you're not. <laughs> Hold fast your confession even when you fall short. Because your confession was never built on the fact that you were good enough in the first place. Because you're not. You're never going to be good enough. If you're trying to be good to be accepted by the Lord, you're, you're just not going to make it. Jesus, what He accomplished for us, allowing the, the righteousness of what Christ has accomplished into your life, on your life, on your everyday living, Jesus is holding fast to you. And so hold fast to your hope in Him, no matter what you're facing. And then the third let us, con let us statement is that it, it says, let us consider one another. In verses 24 and 25, this, this has three parts to it. It says, therefore, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, some, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Again, there are three parts to this let us statement. One, one of the uh, problems that we deal with is, is really this, this idea of fellowship, of really coming together as, as believers. We're kind of in a unique situation that most of us just meet here on Sunday. Uh, a lot of us, uh, you know, we see each other sometimes during the week. But the, the first part of it, it says to stir one another, let us stir one another up to good love, uh, to love and to good works. Now, think about the argument that he's making. Therefore, again, therefore, in light of how Jesus has loved you and brought you to God, then as Christ's followers, stir one another up to love and to good works. And, and again, remember, this is one of those indicative imperative texts 
where God tells us something that he has done and then he calls us to do. You see, one of the ditches that, that we can fall into is the ditch of fruitless Christianity. That, that it becomes unconcerned with love. It becomes unconcerned with good works. But the reality is that mindset is totally foreign to any kind of Christianity informed by the actual words in the New Testament. Give you some examples. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Matthew 5, 16, uh, it says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Ephesians 2, 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The author of Hebrews would not have us neglect good works, but would, would have us look to the cross to enter into the holy place by faith and from that position vigorously pursue love and good works. We are to stir one another up to these things. And even stronger, he says that we are to consider how to stir one another up to love and to good works. And the picture is of you and I sitting down and literally strategizing how we might encourage one another to be more fruitful. One of the immediate obstacles to our obedience to, to this text would have to be that we just don't like being interfered with all that much. <laughs> we kind of want to do our own thing, and, but, but we have to submit to being interfered with. That's what the Bible says. If, the Bible says if iron is to sharpen iron, we have to come into contact with each other. You can't do that on a Zoom call. You got to be eyeball to eyeball. You got to be strategizing about what, what your plan is to do to create love and to accomplish good works. So that brings us to the second part of that instruction is that don't neglect meeting together as some do. You see, Christianity is founded on the new covenant and on community. It's not individualistic. It's not atomized. There, there was a, a member of a certain church who previously had been attending services regularly and then all of a sudden he just stopped going. After a few weeks, the, uh, the pastor decided to visit him. It, it was a, a chilly evening. The, the, the pastor found the man at home and he was there alone and he was sitting before this blazing fire. And guessing the reason for the, the pastor's visit, the man welcomed him and he led him to a big chair near the fireplace and he just waited. Well, the pastor made himself comfortable but said nothing. In the grave silence, he contemplated the play of the, the flames around the burning logs. And after some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs and he carefully picked up a, a, a brightly burning ember and he placed it to one side of the hearth. All alone, all by itself. And then he sat back in his chair and he's still silent there. And, and the host watched all of this in quiet fascination. And as the one lone ember's fire diminished... There was a momentary glow and then his fire was no more. Soon it was cold and dead as a doornail. But not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting. 
And just before the pastor was ready to leave, he picked up the cold, dead ember and he, he placed it back in the middle of the fire and immediately it began to glow once more with the light and the warmth of the, the burning coals around it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, his host said, Thank you so much for your visit and especially for the fiery sermon. <laughs> I'll be back in church next Sunday. You see, the, the same is true for us. We, we must never give in, especially in today's world. We must never give in to the cultural forces that are laboring, working overtime to keep us alone, ineffective, and disconnected. We are the church. And the truth is, if you're not doing it, it's not happening. If you're not being the church, then church is not going to happen. It's not about the buildings. It's not about the steeple. It's not, it is about the people. And if you're not being the church, church is not happening. The third part of it is in, encourage one another, especially as the day draws near. As you're, meet, as you're meeting together and stirring one another up to love and good works, encourage one another in light of the day. Now, a lot of pastors, I've heard a lot of theologians talk about this, that this is a reference to the second coming of Christ. But if you look at this in context, it, it seems that, that he expected the Hebrew Christians to see this day arrive, not as a far future date. They were expecting to see this day play out in their life and in their time. Either way you believe, and I'm not telling you which way to believe, I'm just giving you what, what I study. Either way, the message is plain, to encourage one another as you gather in the name of Christ. The, the church isn't to function as the world functions. We're, we're not in competition with each other. As, as the, as we're, we're not competitors. The body of Christ is not to, to be like that. It's not to operate like that. We aren't in competition. We are in cooperation. That's why I tell people, if you're for Jesus, I'm for you. <laughs> I don't care what your background is. don't care what church you went to, denomination you're part of. If you're for Jesus, I'm for you. Because we, we want each to succeed, each member to stand tall. We are to be those who, as the Apostle Paul says, we are to be those to, that bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's what the Bible says. Well, we start that by being encouraging. We, we don't aim to feel tall by cutting our brothers and sisters down, but to build them up in love. Our world is so tremendously bad at this. We, we are really, really good at sarcastic quipping. Cutting down, scoring points. We are not practiced in honoring one another, respecting one another, building one another up. But the truth is, we can be. Because we are Christ followers, that means that we belong to God. It is the Christ life that matters. And that together we are all one by our union with the Lord. Our one Lord, our one faith, our one baptism is what the scripture tells us. We are supposed to have new hearts. God's law, he said, is going to be inscribed on our hearts, on our inner being. 
<laughs> we, we have a, a new spirit in us. We have all come into community. We, we, we've all gathered together coming into the to, to community in this body of Christ by admitting, admitting that none of us are real great. And I'll be the first one to say that. That none of us have it all together. I mean, that's the entry fee. Just waving the white flag up front and saying, Yep, my only hope for good is Christ in me. Because, again, we, we can never be good enough on our own. And so we, we can put down our competition, our competitiveness when it comes to being Christ followers. We can be on each other's teams. We can honor and respect and build one another up as we bear one another's burdens in love. And then the, the final let, let us is really not a let us, but it says become God's super synagogue. And let me explain what I mean by that. You see, as we do these three things, as we consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, but rather encouraging one another, as we do that, we become what this passage calls in the Greek, God's super synagogue. The, the phrase meet together in verse 25 is very interesting. It, it's built from the Greek word from which we get the word synagogue and, and the whole thing that Jesus was trying to communicate to the Jewish people was that there was a deeper meaning of being gathered together being synagogued together through him you see the Jewish people clung to the old covenant the old shadows refusing their Messiah they rejected him <clears throat> And he, he just, he longed again to synagogue them together under his wing. That's what he said. So many times I would gather you like a hen gathers her chicks and under my wing to, to hold you close. And so the, the day drew near when, when they would have, the, the, the Jewish people would have their house left to them desolate. The temple in, in Jerusalem would be burned to the ground. The Jewish people would be scattered and dispersed to other lands and they would be isolated and alone. For years, scientists were baff baffled by the mystery of floating fire ants. When placed in water, an individual fire ant will flounder, struggle, and then eventually sink. But when the fire ants band together, they, they form life rafts that help them survive the, the flash floods of the, the Brazilian rainforest. And as a, a unified raft, they can even travel for months before reaching dry land. That's amazing, isn't it? An article in the Los Angeles Times summarized a new research study that has unlocked the secret of this natural mystery. After collecting a bunch of ants, scientists dropped them into containers of water. And the ants quickly spread out and formed themselves into rafts. Each individual ant used its claws to... And, and, and the adhesive pads on their legs to grip onto each other. And one researcher said, at first, it just looks like a tangle of bodies and limbs everywhere, but the longer you look at the picture, the more you're able to distinguish between different body parts, and you begin to see the connection. And then the insects use air pockets that form uh, around their bodies to keep themselves afloat. And the article concluded, the, the research sheds light on how deeply social insects act together. 
almost as if they're part of a super organism. As one scientist said, the individuals acting together create this awareness of the environment that no individual ant on its own has. As Christ followers, God is doing something even greater than that. He is making an epi-synagogue out of all of us. He's bring us, bringing us together in Christ. Making a super synagogue of his people. As they synagogue together. Not just in Israel. But globally for us today. And so we're back to this word. Therefore, therefore, in light of what Jesus, our, what his high priestly ministry has accomplished for us, which takes us literally into the holy place of God. That's what Ephesians tell us, that we're already seated in the heavenlies with Christ Jesus. And so what his priestly, high priestly ministry has accomplished for us takes us literally into the holy place of God that let us draw near to God in Christ Jesus. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. And let us do this all together, not neglecting to synagogue together. But rather encouraging, stirring one another up to love and to good works. You see, this, this season we're going to have that opportunity of gathering together and meeting together with, with a lot of different people, family, friends, maybe new friends, new people. And are, the question is, are they going to be able to see Christ in you? Are they going to be able to, to feel His presence in your life? We're not really knowing what it is. It's like I say all the time, share Christ as much as you can. Use words if you have to. They've got to see it first. And the only way we can do that is by drawing near to God. Coming with our our minds cleansed, our, our conscience clean, our hearts pure, sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. Being able to reach out and, and pull in rather than building a wall and staying away. The world needs this. And we are supposed to be those that are experts in doing that. Amen? Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you again for the power of your word. It always accomplishes what you set out to accomplish in us. And I pray, Father, that we will take these let us statements and let us begin that, that work, that work of, of sharing Christ with those that we come in contact by the way we live, by the way we act. It's like the old saying goes, a sermon is better lived than preached. Thank you that you give us so many sermons to follow and to live out each and every day. As we come into the season of Advent, Father, help us to just be mindful and aware of the spiritual conditions of people around us, friends, families, new people that we might meet. And give us the courage to speak out in love and good works. The Lord bless you and keep you.
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all.